Welcome to day three of DSCI 2017. Our multinational theme continues with an important keynote address this morning in the East Theatre by Lieutenant General Frank Leidenberger of the German Army. The German Pavilion is hosting over 30 companies this year, reflecting the growing importance of the defence budget in Germany, growing by some 8% to 37 billion euros this year. Later on this morning in the West Theatre, the Minister for Defence Procurement, Harriet Baldwin, will be giving a keynote address. I'm talking from the forecastle of HMS Argyle, one of the seven naval ships at DSEI 2017. Ships representing the Royal Navy, the Irish Navy and the Belgian Navy. I hope you will go to the concierge desk in the main hall and book your visit to one of these seven ships to witness the innovations taking place in the maritime sector. We're also running our daily waterborne live demonstrations here in the dock again today, with demonstrations at 1200 hours and 1530 hours. I hope you enjoy day three of DSEI 2017. I look forward to seeing you at the exhibition. So DCI TV finds itself on the street group stand. Uh, they've just unveiled their new Gepard armoured vehicle. Fortunate to be joined by Mark Lineberry from Street Group, who can explain a little bit about the significance he thinks of the platform being unveiled here at DCI. Mark? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, this is a great uh, opportunity to unveil our latest technology here, our latest vehicle, the Gepard uh, DSCI. It's my first time here, so I mean, I'm new to the company, but I've been told that uh, this is this is the go-to event, so we definitely wanted to um, unveil it here. A little bit about the platform's capabilities. What would it be used for typically? You know, it can be used by the military or the police um, in uh, obviously uh, terrain where a normal vehicle couldn't go. The the armored capability provides a high level of protection for the police or uh, the military uh, personnel that need to use it. It's just a very strong vehicle, very powerful, very, um, you know, just sort of, a, it, it adds that extra oomph for units that would need that support. And I, I guess you're obviously looking to, to sort of sell this into various programs and, and sort of uh, countries. Uh, do you have anything lined up that you can sort of disclose? Um, I can tell you a little bit. Mostly we have our, our clients come from Africa, a lot of African countries. I, I think they'll have an interest in this. We also have a number of clients in the Middle East. So uh, what, what, what sort of reaction have you got from the visitors walking around and seeing this vehicle? Yeah, it, it turns a lot of heads. I mean, as you might expect, uh, a lot of people stop. They have questions. They want to look at it, uh, even if they're just, you know, the common, common person walking by. It, it garners a lot of interest, uh, which is exactly why we wanted to bring it to DSEI. Thanks a lot for your time. Well, we've just had the announcement uh, during the second keynote speech by the UK Secretary of State for Defence, Sir Michael Fallon. He revealed that uh, the UK will purchase a number of uh, unmanned ground vehicles from Harris Corp. We're fortunate to be on the Harris stand itself. I'm joined by Adrian Andrasek. Adrian, thank you. Thank you. Could you just give us a little bit of a reaction to the announcement we've just heard? We were very excited, actually, uh, to hear that we're finally get this life-saving technology into the hands of EOD operators. So it's very exciting news for us. In terms of the capabilities of the platform, it looks very technical, but could you sort of go into some details for us? Yes, actually, so this is designed for IED defeat, which is an improvised explosive device. So unfortunately, that is a problem worldwide. So there's 75 countries dealing with that as an issue, uh, 20,000 civilians and are killed or injured a year. So we really want to help mitigate that. So this technology really puts a uh, awesome technology into the hands of an operator so they can send the system downrange so they don't actually have to go in harm's way. And how much detail can you go into in terms of the program and the contract, the numbers involved? Right, so it is a 55 million pound contract for 56 units and it's to be fielded in December of 2020. Adrian, thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Well, just moments after delivering his keynote speech, the Air Chief Marshal of the RAF, Sir Stephen Hillier, has joined us, DSCI TV, uh, to have a quick chat. Sir Stephen, thanks so much for taking the time and having a chat with us. First off, could you just explain a little bit about what DSCI as a show means to the service? 
Well, uh, thank you, and I'm very grateful for the opportunity to visit DSEI today. What this means for the service is it's an opportunity to bring together all of the elements of the whole force and also to engage interna internationally. The whole force is about the regulars and reserves in the RAF, it's about our civil servants and it's about our industry partners and this is an opportunity to examine opportunities, to exploit them, uh, to develop them together so that we give the best output for defence. But also with our international partners as well are so important, so important to everything that we do. A lot of the public face of the RF is, revolves around the fast jets like this one we have behind us. I think the logistics capability is also very important, particularly with what's going on in the Caribbean. Just a few words about how your logistics uh, platforms operate and the importance to the service as a, as a whole. Well, as you're uh, touching on, uh, it's the whole breadth of capabilities. And so right now we have I-STAR and combat air capabilities uh, on operations in Iraq and Syria. but. What we've shown through the fantastic efforts we've made in support of uh, alleviating the consequences of Hurricane Irma just show that flexibility and adaptability uh, which are so important. So right now I have C-17s, A-400s, uh, Voyagers, Hercules, Chinooks and Pumas all in the Caribbean doing what they can do to um, uh, relieve uh, so much suffering and such terrible devastation. The logistics are the vital part of that. Uh, it's not just about the air capabilities, it's our ability to quickly bring those all together so that we can deploy at range and sustain at range. That's a vital part of what the Royal Air Force uh, does on a day-to-day -day basis. Just finally, um, about integrating newer platforms into the service, how do you best balance the fourth generation with the new fifth generation that will come in? Well, all of those capabilities are uh, important and so yes, we have some fifth generation capabilities coming online and that's very exciting. We have a lot of fourth generation, we have a lot of four and a half generation. So uh, I describe it as the next generation Air Force and the next generation Air Force will be defined not just by the fantastic platforms that we have, but our ability to take all the information, integrate it in a way which allows us to make decisions quickly and apply effect equi uh, quickly. That's partly to do with technology, it's partly also to do with processes, and it's a lot to do with people. We've just got some fantastic people in the RAF and in industry who can make that happen. So Stephen, thank you. Well, of course, one of the reasons what makes uh, DSCI one of the most significant and important defence exhibitions and conferences around the world is its ability to draw the main players, the big hitters. We're fortunate enough to be joined by Andrew Tyler, who is the chief executive of Northrop Grumman Europe, who will explain a little bit about the presence here at DSCI. Andrew, why are you here? Well, quite simply, it's the biggest and the best, isn't it? This is a show that brings together customers and industrial partners from all, all across the world and all across the, the military domains. And for a company like ourselves, it's very large, working across navies, armies, air forces, joint commands, secure, cyber security forces. This is where it all comes together. One of the things we've picked up from the keynote speeches has been the need, the desire from the UK government to create industrial partnerships. Can you explain a little bit more about how that would happen? How would you, how would you harness that? So industrial partnerships are absolutely fundamental in the defence and security business. I defy anybody to name a major programme that doesn't involve key industry partners. None of us are big enough or comprehensive enough, however large the company is, to do this on our own. One of the great things about DSCI is it's, it's a real bringing together of the clan. It's where all of those industry partners get together and although we do spend a lot of our time with our customers, we probably spend about 50% of our time with our key partners and that can be anything from for example just a, a couple of hours ago where I had a very small uh, small and me, small company in with me talking about a particular kind of technology and only half an hour previously I was one of with one of the big German companies talking about opportunities on the other side of the world. Only something where like DSEI brings all those pieces together. You mentioned technology. What sort of technology do you think uh, is most current and most important developing now, whether it's unmanned or cybersecurity? Where's the best place to be? Yeah, so that's one of the things I like about DSCI is it gives us an opportunity to talk about new concepts, next gen technologies that we think are going to be transformational on the battle space. For us, the big things this year are autonomy and unmanned as themes across all the domains. Networking. Networking has been the Cinderella in this area, but networking is how we get the maximum value out of all the defense assets on, on the battle space. And of course, cyber. Um, cyber is so pervasive now, both cyber defense, cyber offense, how do we exploit the cyber warfare arena? Um, and that's going to be a big, big theme for everybody at this conference, I'm sure. Thank you very much for your time.
DSEI is, is Britain's showcase to the world. Every two years this exhibition grows larger and larger but shows the world what British companies are capable of in developing the next generation of equipment that armed forces need and gives the British military also the opportunity to uh, demonstrate how we are keeping ahead of our adversaries and how we want to work increasingly in collaboration with our international partners. Well, we're regenerating the Royal Navy. You've seen over the last year investment uh, decisions being announced in dreadnought submarines, in uh, new frigates, the development of the two uh, carriers uh, to strengthen our, our fleet. So we are regenerating the Royal Navy, investing in it for the next, uh, to give us the fleet we need for the next 20 to, uh, 20 to 30 years. Regenerating the Royal Navy will enable us to have a uh, a, a proper presence on all the oceans of the world, including Asia-Pacific. I'm sending next year a frigate into Asia-Pacific on the first visits for a number of years. I've signed an agreement with uh, Dukham, uh, the Indian Ocean port of Oman, that will give our Royal Navy access to that ocean. We are final, finishing our new base in Bahrain, HMS Dufair, that will strengthen our uh, ability there uh, to uh, give us more presence in the Gulf. So you will see as the Navy regenerates, you will start to see more of our Royal Navy working with partners around the world. And we need to do that because increasingly Asia Pacific is not just the growth region of the world, but it's increasingly a, a region where more and more threats are growing. Well, the announcements I've made today are essentially about better protecting the armed forces that we send into danger on our behalf, ensuring, for example, as uh, more and more insurgents' uh, use is made of improvised explosive devices, that um, soldiers who have to go in and deal with them are better protected by the use of uh, robots, that those in armoured vehicles can better sense the threat coming towards them. So we're not just, we're not just giving our armed forces uh, better weapons, we're also ensuring that they are better protected themselves. Well, the keynote speeches at DCI 2017 continued yesterday with the same pace as they did on day one. Uh, in the East Theatre behind us, there are a number of presentations and discussions. Uh, among them was one from General Sinek Carr, who talked about uh, army modernisation plans. But I think importantly in this context of modern deterrence, what we're also doing is resetting our understanding of the divisional level and the core level of operations. This is essential following 15 years of counterinsurgency. And of course, there are obvious capability gaps that weren't necessarily relevant in a counterinsurgency context that now need to be dealt with. But I think we also recognize that in resetting ourselves at the divisional level, we probably need to think about fighting a cleverer or a smarter deep battle. We've only got one division after all, and we can't afford to lose it immediately in the close battle. So I think we need to be reflecting on how we perhaps maneuver to fire rather than just simply think about fire and manoeuvre. So in sum, what I've tried to describe to you is an army that is modernising, it's got an open-minded attitude, it's got a desire to innovate and adapt. Recognising, I think, that the range of tasks that it has ongoing and will confront in the future is very broad. Whether it's being prepared to warfight, thus playing into deterrence and reassurance, whether it's about the forward presence that is the other half of that, and the capacity building and indeed contributing to the prosperity agenda that is the other part of that. And also Ben Wallace, uh, Minister of State for Security, who talked about, uh, among other things, the threat that the UK faces in terms of terrorism. So we must never stop defending our values and protecting our society from the attacks that come. From cybercrime, terrorism, espionage and sabotage, the UK and her citizens face attack. Some of our attackers are criminals, and some are foreign states. They use the shopping bazaars of the internet to purchase weapons, malware and know-how. They use encrypted networks to plot attacks and to launder dirty money. They use social media to spread misinformation. The barriers to entry for aspiring cyber criminals fall every day. Crime is changing and we must change with it.